Ready. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, Dr. Al Hewer here. I'm a uh, professor at Rutgers uh, School of Health Professions. I'm also uh, Terry uh, uh, Shenfield's partner in um, a and lectures and um, some other things as well. But most importantly, want to thank you guys for, for joining us today. And uh, in this uh, lecture, it's actually two concomitant lectures, two related lectures. We're going to be talking about um, quality, um, healthcare quality, and then a related topic of reliability. So under the umbrella of uh, quality, does reliability uh, fall? And I will I will drill down fairly deeply on reliability, but but basically in the in the in the context that we'll be using it today, reliability has to do with repeatability, okay, standardization, and not standardization for the sake of standardization alone, but really for the sake of you know designing a protocol that adheres to best practices and then setting up a process to help ensure that the people implementing it, that the people using it, do it in a consistent manner. So we'll talk again, drill down more on that. So some of the learning objectives that I'll be covering in um, this slash these lectures will be defining healthcare quality, also defining reliability, and how those definitions, particularly where you're talking about quality, how they can actually vary. We'll also review some key milestones in the history of healthcare quality. And I, I, I ruthlessly stole some, some material from, believe it or not, my dissertation. When I got my uh, doctoral degree at Seton Hall University, I actually did it um, in a topic related to institutional healthcare quality. If there's time, I'll maybe drill down a little bit more on that. But, but the first part of my dissertation, when I actually set the framework, really talks about the evolution of, of quality and the evolution of reliability in healthcare. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. We'll evaluate facts about our current system among them. And again, I'm tipping my hand. I do that sometimes. We'll be talking about the, the uh, paradox, so the irony or the paradox that our healthcare system in the United States is by far, by far the most expensive in terms of percentage of GDP and in terms of the spending per person or per capita. And one might think, in intuitively that, well, if you're spending more and you know, if you're a wealthy country um, with, if you will, uh, you know, open media sources that you would probably have uh, uh, you know, superior uh, outcomes, you know, healthcare outcomes. And while in some discrete areas we do, in many we do not, we do not. So we'll, we'll examine that more closely as well. We'll compare and contrast some tools um, used to enhance quality and reliability and you guys may have actually used these tools. I imagine that many of you have at a minimum have actually heard about them, read about them, and again, maybe in some cases have actually used them. We'll examine some practical case applications in general, so as they relate to healthcare in general, but also more specific to respiratory care. And perhaps most importantly, perhaps most importantly, I'll be furnishing you with additional resources and references for those who kind of want to, if you will, drill down and learn more uh, about these topics in general or about some of the, you know, the, the more uh, specific details. So what is quality? So, so uh, Terry, myself and Gary, um, in, the, in the panel discussion from about 6 p.m. Eastern time, realize some of you probably are coming from different time zones, but at, at around 6 uh, p.m. till around 7 p.m., we'll be doing a, a panel discussion. And it's it's not it's not a, a death by a monologue. It's not it's not us just up here talking. We're going to actually pose questions to you. And one of the questions that so I, so you know you have time to think about it. But one of the questions that I'm going to be posing to you relates to the definition of healthcare quality. All right. And what's what's interesting to some, interesting to me, and and some others, maybe not to everybody, is that depending upon where the stakeholder and all we mean by a stakeholder is. You know, you have, you have different people that have vested interests in our healthcare system. You know, you have clinicians and clinicians mainly, it's a, you know, not just a source of income, but it's a profession. You have patients, the patients, the constituent patients that we serve. You have payers. Um, the biggest payer in this country, at least, is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. You could say they're the biggest insurer, if you will, loosely put, loosely put. But you also have a lot of privates uh, as well. You have a lot of, you know, Blue Cross Blue, Blue Shield and, and many, many others. Managers, directors, uh, executives, 
society in general. The list actually could go on even further than this. But you you got to think about you know patients patients defining well you know I want I want to get better okay. But the the uh, the definition if you will uh, patients often include does also take into account things like the quality of food, the politeness of staff, et cetera. And hence, one of the areas that, that's closely monitored um, by CMS, but not just by CMS, Joint Commission, by some of these oversight organizations I'll be talking about uh, today in, in the presentation, um, that, that it really they really rely on some of the feedback from patients and their family members. So again, we'll, uh, we'll examine that more closely as well. So again, these varying definitions. So the Institute of Medicine, you know, I, I, it's come up in, in various lectures. Um, it will certainly, you know, be be described. I'll describe the, the Institute of Medicine. You know, simply put, um, is a think tank. Is a think tank, um, and they they actually have come up with some exposés and even books. Um, one of their, uh, you know, their their classics was to, to Air is Human, and they really talked about the number of uh, errors. Um, that that occur and it, and it was you know up up to about ninety eight thousand per year and there was some variability there but even if, even if it was half that okay because I they give that they give a range it's from the forties to the upper nineties um, so even if you say it's the lower end of the scale it's only it's only fifty thousand only fifty thousand medical errors that actually result in you know harm or worse or death to patients they were the ones that not just um, if you will publish that but they you know they furnished they did a lot of the the, the legwork to get that data and actually publish it. So they define, they define uh, healthcare quality as services for individuals and populations, which increase the likelihood of, of a desired, you know, health, house, uh, if you will, health outcome or outcomes. I, again, I could go on, but you get the gist. The, the Journal of the American Medical Association, also known as JAMA. So when you read a manuscript that's pub published in JAMA, you probably wanna, that, that doesn't, doesn't mean it's, it's bu absolutely bulletproof, but it's probably something worth reading and it's probably something whose results are relatively valid and can be generalized to a larger population. So JAMA defines healthcare quality as the capacity of the elements of that care, of care, to achieve legitimate medical and non-medical goals. Sounds a little stuffy, but you know, it is what it is. Patients, patients, it's more colloquial. It's more, did I get better? Was the food good? Was the staff polite? Um, did it did it cost me anything? What was my copay? Did they waive a copay? You know, by by definition, uh, providers are not supposed to upfront waive copays because that's that can entice individuals to you know if you will use those services after the fact after those services have been used in negotiating if you will a payment schedule. Sometimes those uh, copays are are waived, but irrespective, patients certainly did it cost me anything. And what you found um, is. In the past, and I'm, I'm slowing my cadence down for a reason, in about the past decade or so, and it really does roughly correspond with the Affordable Care Act, or, or also known as uh, Obamacare. Um, what you have found is that um, healthcare premiums, you know, healthcare insurance premiums have gone up notably. And the, the, the network, if you will, um, has shrunken and in the, in the co-pays have increased. So patients or, you know, patients who actually don't either don't have a employee sponsored plan or have one that's frankly not that great. OK, you'll find that a lot of those co-pays are, um, you know, are more uh, uh, substantial. For a while, I was actually uh, covered under two plans. I was covered under a hospital system plan and I was covered as a Rutgers employee under the Rutgers. It's a, it's a very good um, state sponsored plan, um, a health insurance plan. And I, I could compare them side by side, and there really was no comparison. The state plan was far superior to me um, in terms of copay, network, et cetera, et cetera. So to, to patients, you can imagine that that certainly matters that in, in their definition of quality. So you know, if you were to if you were to actually um, talk to the quote unquote experts, get them all in a room, feed them, you know, lock the door, and don't let them out until they come up with the, the, the you know some of the attributes of, of quality. All right. So I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but you know, you, what they have found is that the experts, there are some attributes or characteristics that many, many of the experts agree upon, okay? And I've listed them here, but just, you know, technical performance. You know, was the correct procedure performed correctly at the, at the right time on the right site, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
patient-centeredness, encompassing qualities of compassion, empathy. Gary talked about some of this. Responsiveness to needs and values, express pre preferences of the individual patient, et cetera. Now, this is not limitless. It's, it's very difficult. You know, today, we're, you know, many institutions and many organizations um, are short, you know, short staff nurses, short staff respiratory therapists, and the patient centeredness, you know, sometimes can get, you know, pushed a little bit to the side. So we're not talking about necessarily, you know, if, if one of your patients is lonely and she wants you to sit at the base of the bed and, you know, talk to her for 15 minutes, that may just not be plausible. But we're really talking about ultimately, even if you can't do that, say, you know, Mrs. Smith, I'll, you know, I'm gonna, I'll come back, but I have other patients I need to see. I really care about you, you know, whatever. I'm glad that your breathing feels better, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways to actually, if you will, convey that patient centeredness, even in the face of the challenges that we have today. Amenities. You know, I, I mentioned those, but the characteristics of the setting, um, and it can even be like what's becoming a big deal, and they're studying this, is in the ICUs having windows, having outside facing windows in the ICU rooms, okay, um, and, it, and they're actually look at some of the outcomes, and, and, and when the setting overall, when the aesthetics or the amenities um, are better, they do find that there's some of them where it not just makes a difference in patient satisfaction scores, but it makes a difference also in some other outcomes as well. Okay, patients that they, you know, if, if they're, that they're, their mental state, if they can actually look outside, if the, if, the, if the staff is politer, if the food is better, that they may actually feel better about things overall and more willing to participate in the plan of care and, and hopefully uh, enabling them to, uh, to get better faster. Access, so being, having coverage, and having access are not the same thing. The degree to which individuals and groups are able to obtain services. So a concrete example, and I don't have a case on this, but it would certainly make an interesting one, and both for Gary's lectures and, and for this one, it has to do with you know, patients who are covered under a, uh, you know, they, they tend to crudely rate health insurance plans as you know, platinum or Cadillac, gold, silver, bronze, and you know, so bronze being at the kind of bottom of that pile certainly meets all of the requirements of the Affordable Care Act and subsequent le legislation, but is just not as good as some of the other plans. Get an individual covered under a bronze or a silver plan, and they are they're unfortunately diagnosed with a, uh, a you know a, a cancer of of X Y Z organ. Um, and there's a relatively new, not experimental, recently approved, but very expensive medication that has shown to let's say an immunotherapy. To, to, to increase lifespan or maybe even uh, help cure the cancer. But that insurance company does not cover it, okay? They don't cover it um, and they don't have to. It's not, it's not you know, universal, they don't have to. So the drug exists, but the patient slash patient family are, need to gonna, are, are gonna have to come up with you know, $170,000 a year or more, you know, some way, somehow, go fund me or whatever, in order to gain that access. So coverage and access are not the same. Um, equity. So, you know, that's about every, everything's e even all the time, but relative equity, the application of all the necessary services of modern scientific medicine to the needs of all people. Now, I, I was schooled by uh, Dr. Craig Scanlon. And he was actually my teacher. He was my colleague, my friend, but my teacher at first. He all, it was Terry's as well. And he always said to us, listen, when we, we used to write questions for exams. First, I wrote questions for exams that for our students. Later, you know, I'm an item writer for the MBRC. So, you know, I've, I've been schooled. But it basically said, you know, not, rarely, if ever, is anything all anything. So, you know, the equity part is, I think what they really mean here is to have it as, as you know, have it as close as possible to you know, meeting the needs of all the people as close as possible, Le leveling that playing field as close as possible. Efficacy, how well resources are used in achieving a given result, so efficacy. And cost effectiveness certainly matters. And I kind of alluded to that with you know, regard to the stakeholders and patients and things along those lines. There's, there's often more than one accepted way to, um, to treat a patient or diagnose a patient. Um, and there's a lot of variables to go that go into, you know, well, which one to use? Well, one of them is cost effectiveness. And with some of the medications, sometimes, you know, some of the you know, hospitals and providers will actually, when they do a, 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 let's say a sputum culture and sensitivity, or they pan culture a patient, including urine, blood, you know, sputum, the whole thing. And they find that indeed the patient's sputum is infected with, you know, certain bacteria. And they, they, they'll look and say, you know, this one antibiotic um, you know, the, the, the microbe is very sensitive to antibiotic A, but antibiotic A is 
very expensive. Antibody B, the, the, uh, uh, the microbe is reasonably sensitive to, but it's like one fifth the cost. So at times those decisions are made based on, well, this is very close to the, to the most effective, but it's one fifth the cost. That's the medication that we're, that we're gonna, gonna pursue. And you know, it, it, you know, it, it, if, if it's if it's extreme, if you're giving a medication that's one tenth as effective, then that, that's no bueno. If it's nearly as effective, it's a judgment call, and we, we can get into degrees on it. But cost effectiveness matters, and that's really the theme of this. And then looking at you know these the stakeholders, so kind of looking at the clinician, the patient, the payer, etc., and you're looking at how heavily that each of those stakeholders might actually weigh. Um, the technical performance, the patient centeredness. And this has been studied. I, I you know, I, I jokingly, you know, I, I, I make things up when I'm with my friends and family or whatever. We're just telling jokes and that sort of thing. But I didn't make this up. It, the, these plus signs are the results of studies that were done to really examine, well, well, how, you know, where do clinicians place the greatest effort? Not surprisingly, or the greatest emphasis, technical performance, okay? The, the patient certainly wants technical performance. The, the thing is, the, the, the rub with that one is many times they're not in a position to judge it. Having a device at your hands and Googling something doesn't make you literate in it necessarily. It may actually, in some cases, give you a little information, which may, which may be a distorting factor. Okay, I'm all for you know, patients being informed, that sort of thing. I just think that at times when they get a fragment of information and hang on to it too heavily, it can actually be problematic. Um, the payer, you can just you know see efficiency and cost effectiveness. You know they they care about technical performance, they care about some of these other things, but clearly they're looking at efficacy versus cost effect that that cost uh, benefit um, relationship. And the managers and society kind of their you know their emphasis makes sense and is fairly intuitive as well. So when I was uh, again doing my dissertation many many moons ago, um, uh, Avis Donabadian was one of the ones that I have um, I referenced in it. But I've also referenced, I'm currently teaching a graduate level uh, healthcare quality course. And I talk about Don and Beatty, and you really think about him, you know, organizational, this doesn't have to be healthcare, but organizational quality. You know, he actually did a lot of his work in healthcare quality, but you could really take the, the concept of structure, process, and outcome. You could actually apply that to, to many domains within and outside of healthcare. So, really, what we're talking about is, and, and you know, the cases I'll describe at the end. We'll, we'll kind of illustrate this, that many, many errors and quality issues in healthcare and beyond are not just, oh, gee, Al screwed up, okay? It's not, you know, he what it is, well, Al screwed up, but Al's a brand new hire. He only has one year experience under his belt and he was left alone in the ICU and night shift, you know, with, without a resource person, okay? And something happened, doesn't matter. It, you know, so nobody died, but it was something that was an un undesirable uh, event. Um, but yeah, look at, well, the structure. The structure there is, well, you know, he didn't, he didn't have, you know, a, a resource, he didn't have a physical resource person or somebody even to, to call, you know, it doesn't have to be like physically there. So the, the structure wasn't great. The actual process was, you know, well, he, maybe he shouldn't have been in the, in the ICU. If there's, a, if there's an opportunity to have him elsewhere until he gets more comfortable there, having one year experience and, and, you know, being there alone and looking at the outcome. The outcome may have been, you know, a missed intubation or a medication error or, you know, a patient who should have been extubated sooner and just was not, you know, and, and they, may be, they, they may have done an unplanned, self or unplanned extubation. So uh, Donna Badian looks at all those factors and really the, the, the theme with this slide is, Rarely is it, oh, it's just the person, okay? It's just an individual. Usually it's, you know, a whole bunch of things lining up in a bad way. When the space shuttle uh, blew up, um, they found that it was like 32 or 33 undesirable things regarding the structure and process that lined up at, at, at ill times, at, at the worst possible time that resulted in that event happening. There's a lot of redundancy and then redundancy on top of redundancy, not just in healthcare, but in aerospace and other higher risk industries. Um, and they just found that despite that, despite the, the best planning and the best, best structure and process that it just, you know, it, it, things went wrong and things changed as a result. A little bit on the, the history, by the way, um, there's organizations that preceded the Joint Commission and I just, uh, you know, would not, would not, um, wouldn't want to bore you completely to tears. 
Um, and indeed, you know, Florence Nightingale, you know, there was really a Florence Nightingale and she actually did collect quality data, but it was much before 1951. So there's a lot of things that ha were happening in quality um, before 1951. The problem was that they were happening, they were kind of like um, not connected in it. There's no communication mechanism. There was somebody doing something over here and somebody was like throwing some spaghetti, not a lot of spaghetti, a little bit of spaghetti against the wall and see where it lands type of deal. In 51 and in 51 slash 52, things changed and the, the Joint Commission um, was, was, was actually a private, I could say they're not, they're not governmental, but a private accreditation uh, agency. And they started you know, issuing a lot of things regarding quality standards that have obviously uh, they've, they've evolved since then. And today we end up with you know, TJC, it's no, no longer JCO for a while, for a decade or so, um, but the Joint Commission, they, you know, Accredit, uh, you know, hospitals and you know, psychiatric centers, outpatient, you know, home care, et cetera, et cetera. But they also provide a lot of resources um, in order to enable those organizations to um, try to put together a structure and process that is m more conducive. I say most conducive, but you know, highly conducive to delivering quality outcomes. Um, they don't focus intensely on outcomes, but they've done a lot more over the past 10 or 15 years in focusing on that. They used to be really heavily reliant on, on, pro, on process and structure, and now they've really kind of taken a tact really, you know, with the patient tracers. They take a patient from the time that they're actually admitted to the hospital, uh, maybe even preceding that, and trace their, their, their stay and trace the elements of their care and now they're beginning to even trace the patient they left the hospital you know and then and then what happened you know did was their follow up was their pre uh you know pre discharge education you know was there uh post discharge follow up were appointments made gary mentioned pulmonary rehab if they were referred to pulmonary rehab and a pulmonologist and the barriers were you know transportation and frankly let's just say they're depressed they don't even want to get out of bed no less you know, hop in a, a, an Uber or whatever, and they go to pulmonary rehab, that those issues were, were in some significant manner addressed. Um, so they do the tracers and, and clearly, so they put, you know, th that relates to outcomes because it would be bad for a patient not to be doing well. And it's even worse if they have to get readmitted, particularly if that readmission time is, you know, uh, is, is, is 30 days or less. Um, in, in, so so in, in 1965, you know, um, Medicare conditions of participation. So what they were really looking at is in order to, you know, be able to participate in Medicare reimbursement that, you know, uh, hospitals and healthcare providers um, needed to meet certain conditions. I will tell you modern day today, it does, uh, it, one of those conditions is they need to be accredited. It's not necessarily accredited by the Joint Commission. Joint Commission is the, is the most widespread accrediting body in healthcare but there are others that are out there as well, just to make that point. Um, 1972, Medicare's professional standards review organizations. So they focus on overuse, misuse, really looking at, um, you can take a look at uh, like reimbursement for home oxygen in the 60s and early 70s was, it was a gold mine, just quite frankly. So the Medicare professional standards review organizations, they looked at that more, in, more intensely. And as a result of that and, and uh, subsequent legislation, there's been um, a lot of uh, reduction in abuse and just frankly, reduction in reimbursement where in some cases where it was warranted, in some cases they cut kind of deeply, arguably too much so. 1989, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, also known as ARC, um, focused on investing you know, a clinical, um, in, in clinical effectiveness, treatment outcomes, practice guidelines. What that means, that's like a bunch of gobbledygook, right? So what that means is, um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, they fund, they fund a lot of, uh, through grants, a lot of research related to things like, uh, many, many things, but, but, but one of the things that's near and dear to my heart are simulations. We had a couple of pieces um, uh, published recently on, on simulations. Um, so I, I don't want to, this isn't a presentation on simulations, but a lot of the, um, so one of our colleagues, uh, Rob Chatburn, so Rob does a lot of work with mechanical ventilation. He lectures for us. He lectures a lot of places. Um, Rob's also a co-editor uh, um, with Egan's. He's worked with uh, Gary Kaufman on um, some manuscripts as well and some uh, projects as well. Um, but 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 uh, Rob has also done a lot, not just with 
mechanical ventilation, but with mechanical ventilators, simulators. So really computer-based simulators, really kind of nifty stuff. The point I'm making is this though. ARC is one of the bodies that funded a lot of the research, not Rob's in particular, but a lot of the research related to simulation, okay? Related to a lot, not just simulation, but re related to a lot of things, you know, basically, you know, what's, what, what's a better way of, of, of doing X, Y, and Z? Um, so you're, they're just a fascinating agent. And then they, they, they publish, they publish guidelines out there. Um, they, you know, they, they publish guidelines even on a culture of safety. Um, and that was that was an arbitrary that was based on a lot of the research that they did. They're looking at these you know culture of safety and these variables that are associated with with a safer uh, you know if you will organizational culture. A little more. So again, the air is human, 1999. I'm not going to read this slide. I'm simply say that that was really that that was that was the 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 um, the piece that came out that said Houston, we have a problem. Okay, up to 98,000 you know uh, uh, preventable medical errors. Um, per year. That number is larger now. They they strongly suspect, and some subsequent you know reviews and, and research has really has really indicated it as well. Um, so the other thing I want to I want to also say though about the uh, Institute of Medicine is they've also so you know in 1999 to Air is Human it was like gloom and doom. They have published a lot. One of the pieces, but there's many many more. They published a lot since then that really talk about now what? How do we enhance things? How do, you know, it's, it's bad news, got it. We don't want anybody to suffer or die because we committed errors, but what do we do now? So they have a lot of really good stuff on what does work, the research to back it up and, you know, really common sense, uh, plain language guidelines. So again, uh, ARC's National uh, Healthcare Quality Report, you know, where are we now? You know, so we got substantial improvement in hospital acquired conditions. So things like, ventilator associated pneumonias and ventilator associated events. Okay. Where we look at uh, person family uh, centered care, improvement in communication with the physician, it's a big deal. Um, mechanisms, even things like, you know, some of these electronic health records, it's, it's not funny, funny, but it's kind of good. It's probably mostly good, but not 100% good. It is, you can communicate with your physician through the, the you go into your portal. The portal's linked to your, your Epic or whatever your Cerner or whatever your electronic health record is. And in many cases, and, and we're only getting a handle on this now, is when you write a note about a patient and the patient goes in, a, a note, a note that's really intended to be in the medical record. In, in a lot of these, these electronic health records, the patient can see it. So just be aware what, what you put in those notes. And I, I'm not saying anyone's going to put anything disparaging, but I've seen some physicians put some pretty, you know, when, when they say in quotes, the patient called me an asshole. Sorry if I insulted anybody, whatever. I mean, you know, better make sure that they did. And I would probably tone it down a little bit, even if they did call it. They called me a derogatory name or something along those lines. But they can actually see that in there. Um, care coordination. So the improvement lag behind other priorities. So certain areas we've made uh, more improvement than others. Disparities were common. They actually still are. It, it, to some extent, you know, it's, it's not ironic, like funny ironic, but it's, it's, it is ironic that you know, the extreme, so the extreme rural areas and the extreme, you know, inner city or the areas where you actually see these, these disparities. Terry and I, um, we went to the same respiratory care program. We both, I, I worked for a much shorter time at University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey. So it's really urban area. Um, and even right around University Hospital, it is, it's just, it still needs work. It needs a lot, a lot of work. Uh, but University Hospital came into being because the community said, we need a safety net. This was literally in the, in the 1960s and early 70s. Um, there, were, there were riots in Newark, New Jersey, and there was some, you know, nobody wants to see riots, but there was riots and there was some good that came out of it. And one of them was, you know, the, that, that they had University Hospital that's still there and serves as a outpost, um, if you will, a safety net hospital for a lot of, uh, you know, some, some folks that are not necessarily local, but a lot of the locals. Effectiveness and prevention. So again, cardiovascular treatment improved. So some of this, some of the areas we've improved, some of the areas um, less so. Healthy living, you know, that's a, you know, it, uh, you know, least healthy of developed world. So that's really us still lag behind, you know, other priorities. We're kind of a funny uh, paradox in this respect as well. So you have people that are like health nuts. That you know that don't they're vegans. They exercise. I mean, I exercise, but I also like my Italian food, and you know, I like my cheese. You know, things that whatever. And my cholesterol is a little higher. My ratio is good, but my cholesterol is a little higher than it really should be. 
you know, whatever. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm far from, I used to smoke and I'm, I'm very far from, from perfect, but really they're talking about, we're not talking about like the people that are in the middle or the people that are like health nuts is that we also have a lot of people, particularly where their health literacy is low and health literacy is really defined in many ways, but it really has to do with the extent to which people can really, they understand, you know, many of the key elements of, you know, from, from a, from a lay person of, you know, prevention, healthy lifestyles, you know, low fat diets, at least moderate exercise, not smoking, moderate or no drinking of alcohol, um, you know, diet, you, 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 you get the idea. Stress, you know, managing stress and not managing stress through, through self-medicating with illicit drugs and alcohol and things along those lines. And, you know, so we're, we're one of the, the least healthy, um, but at the same time, it's really kind of an average. We have these people that are really in the low end of the scale, and we have those, these other people that are on the high end, but it's really the people that have really low health literacy in rural areas and often in, in urban areas that kind of, if you will, pull that average down. Um, but, you know, it's also a very, we have a very diverse country. There's many, many countries in the world, not, it's not just they're not as large as us, they're not as diverse. You look at China, it has roughly four times our population, but they're fairly homogenous. They do have this older patient population, they have an a, aging uh, population. So, and, and they're, they tend to be more rural. Um, but when you look at folks that are in, in China that are less than 45 or 50, you know, a lot of them are fairly homogenous, you know, and, and their, their access to information, their access to technology, whatever, you know, barring, you know, any sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, censoring that that's there is actually pretty good. We're on the other end of the spectrum. We have a very diverse population. We give people a lot of choices. And sometimes, frankly, they may, they don't make the right ones. Affordability, we're not, you know, worst. And we, to that, don't worry about 2010. I'm, I'll present you some more recent data, but it's just, you know, no affordability measures change from 2000 to 2017. And this is just a little bit quicky, quicky, choppy, choppy from 2018. This is probably available for 2019 or 20, but do understand this, this information tends to lag two or three years. They have, the, they have the data, they need to crunch it, they need to refine it, they need to verify it, et cetera. Um, so this is fairly up to date, and this is also ARC's a National uh, Healthcare Quality Report. The upper um, you know, depiction of the United States is overall quality of care by state. I'm a Jersey boy, so we're the, in the first uh, quartile. Again, I'm not, I don't mean to discriminate against anybody else from other states. You just take a quick look. If you're in the gray there, you're in the fourth quartile. I mean, you're worst, okay? If you're in the blue, you're in, in the highest. The, the rub goes like this. So I'm a Jersey boy, born and raised, you know, born in Newark, New Jersey, just where I was talking before, um, and a Jersey boy my entire life. But check out the bottom the, the depiction here. Average differences in quality of care, Blacks, Hispanics, Asians, compared to whites, okay? So while we have good good quality, okay, we also have these disparities, okay? So we're actually in the top for quality, we're in the bottom for, if you will, equality. Um, and I, I would argue access, but equality and access. So you can see there's a lot of paradoxes. There's some that are good in one, good in the other. Unfortunately, there's some that are low, you know, um, uh, on, multiple, on multiple fronts. Rise of consumerism, people are more educated, um, not just in general, but they, they have better access to data. There's more transparency. The Affordable Care Act actually demanded it. Um, they, they actually made it a, a requisite. Um, but so there's more, there's more uh, if, uh, data that's out there. One of them is the, you know, the, the hospital inpatient quality reporting program started in 2003. And it, it, it helps um, us, us as consumers, not as clinicians make better and more informed decisions. Um, and it has, a, the, the general consensus has substantial positive impact. Um, hospital compare, I'll, I will show you, um, it's, it's not so much for us as clinicians, but us as consumers. If you wanna compare, um, I'll just throw three hospitals in my area. Uh, I work at Morristown Medical Center in, um, if you will, sub, sub, uh, Northern suburb, suburban New Jersey, um, compare that with, uh, with, with um, a local hospital, uh, um, Cooperman, Barnabas, and Livingston. So that's about 10 miles away, roughly the same type of population with another hospital. And, I, I'm, I, and I'm deliberating which hospital to go to for open heart surgery. Now, again, I, you're not just going to rely on hospital compare to do that, but it would be another, if you will, data point. You can look at how their outcomes are compared to the average. And then you would actually have here the physician quality reporting system. So, you know, incentivize the discussion of quality between patients and providers. So really what they're saying there is, is for, you know, 
edu for educating patients, there's now, if you will, uh, codes, reimbursement codes, um, where if it's properly documented, where the provider, the physician, the nurse practitioner, the physician assistant can actually get you know, reimbursed, uh, you know, if, if the state allows for it, get reimbursed um, for, if you will, consulting and maintaining a, 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 di a quality dialogue um, with the actual patient and their family. Quality presence. So again, the Obamacare really 2010, even though it was signed in law 2010, a lot of the statutes did not come into effect until 12 or 13, 2012, 13. They're still being modified. But broadly speaking, there was an intense focus on quality, major shift from volume to value. Okay. So that rewarding, we, we rewarding providers that provide quality care at an at, at a at a uh, value, at, at a good price. More transparency. There's many, many more reports that are out there. For example, um, the the Affordable Care Act um, mandated that that health insurers display their um, their what's called loss ratios. All that means is the uh, the the percentage of premium dollars that they pay out in terms of claims. Um, and they, they actually gave some guidance on it, somewhere around 80%. There's some, there's some factors that influence that, but around 80%, something along those lines. Um, but there's uh, many, many other types of uh, transparency that are out there, um, how much the top executives are actually um, paid, um, you know, what, what percentage of things along those lines. So that you can get an idea, well, the company's making money, but, but these, these executives are making an obscene amount of money. Um, multiple provisions uh, designed to modify the manner in which it's delivered, uh, that, that healthcare is delivered. So these, these programs, including near the bottom of this slide, the, the hospital readmission reduction program of 2012, what they actually did was they actually reward, um, you know, reward or penalize uh, hospitals that have higher or lower 30-day all-cause readmission rates for certain uh, uh, conditions. And two of those conditions are COPD and another one is uh, a pneumonia. There's others, uh, uh, things like congestive heart failure and others as well. Um, and then there's also the hospital acquired condition um, reduction program in 2015. And that really looked at things like um, uh, ventilator associated e events and pneumonias and things along those lines. Results are available among other things in the um, CMS's hospital compare function as well. And this is just, a, 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 if you will, a, a slide uh, depicting that. I'm going to actually move on here in the interest of time. But, you know, you can literally Google, you know, hospital compare or go to uh, cms.gov, hospital compare, put in up to three hospitals, and it'll give you these sorts of uh, ratings. And if you just notice, one final note on this is better than the national rate. And really what they're talking about is peer hospitals. So it's no different than national rate. So it's not like a discrete scale of one to 100, but it gives you some guidance. And it's, again, a, a, another set of data points. Quality and presence. So, you know, again, the uh, Obamacare value-based purchasing, and really what it does is, is it, it will reward hospitals that, if you will, um, meet or exceed metrics in clinical care, or clinical outcomes, um, person and community engagement. That used to be patient satisfaction, but they changed that. Um, safety and uh, uh, efficiency and uh, cost reduction as well. And for hospitals that are actually, you know, meeting or, or exceeding all those, they, they can actually, they will actually get a higher reimbursement, whereas ones that aren't, that, that re reimbursement will they'll essentially be penalized. So the good, quality, you know, over quantity, that's a good, thing. greater transparency, facilitation of data collection, electronic health records, and I use them, I was with students today, but I still work as a, this, this Saturday, this past Tuesday, this Saturday, I'll be at doing 12 hour shift at Morristown Medical Center, and probably in one of the ICUs. And I, so, so I'm, you know, <laughs> Devil's in the detail. Electronic health records are probably in balance, a very good thing. But as long as they're designed well, they're designed with you know, user feedback, they have intuitive in in interfaces. But as far as facilitating data collection, they're, they're basically a data repository. And you know, from a quality perspective, it's a beautiful thing. As long as there's minimum or a minimum of or no gaming of those stats, and there's a way to do, do that, and that's all I'll say. Uh, about that. Uh, the network of organizations committed to quality. So these are really four powerful uh, uh, facets that really point to, you know, some of the, some of the positive uh, aspects of our healthcare system. Mixed, so you have variable outcomes. It happens to be in this country, you know, some of our cancer outcomes are amongst, amongst the best in the world. 
some of our uh, some of our more discrete uh, cardiac ones are as well, um, but but many of our others are not are not. Paradox of technology, and I'm not against technology at all. The thing is, be aware that it's one of the biggest drivers of cost. That that cancer treatment that I mentioned before, that was $170,000 a year or whatever. Sometimes they're a million dollars a year. They're really obscene amounts of, of money. That's that that's that's a driver. That, all that research and development that went into that. Or, you know, you just think of a lot of the, the latest technology um, that's out there. Think of an X-ray versus an MRI. There's a huge cost difference. And hopefully, you know, you don't have MRIs being ordered uh, indiscriminately. Um, a lot of, you know, if you will, redundancy um, as far as oversight redundancy. A lot of these oversight organizations don't communicate well with one another. Um, you also have, you know, the rate of obsolescence. So you have a new electronic health record. Maybe it's obsolete in you know, three years or something along those lines. The bad, too many oversight organizations, administrative burden. I, you know, published a piece in 2016 on that. Uh, you know, I think I have another slide on this somewhere in this presentation, but um, in looking at overall cost of healthcare, and again, too many uh, under or uninsured in this country. Understand that um, healthcare catastrophes, somebody who's uninsured falls off a ladder and incurs $500,000, a million dollars. Somebody who has cancer and they, you know, whatever, and, and incur one of the leading causes of bankruptcy in this country, under or uncovered um, medical uh, catastrophes or disasters. So in a perfect world, you have these organizations, these oversight organizations that, you know, they, they communicate, they, you know, basically result in a synergistic effect of enhanced bedside care. We know that that's not necessarily the case. It's probably a net, in, in net, it's probably a, a net gainer, meaning it's probably more positive than not. But, you know, you have, to, you know, like to today, I'm mean, just like you guys, in a hospital, acute care hospital, there's beds lined up in the hallway and you're trying to transport a patient from point A to point, a, a vented patient. You know, you got the ventilator, you got the IV poles, you got this, you got that, and you got that. When the Joint Commission comes, those beds are gone. They're gone. I actually know where they go. I didn't always know, but they know. They, they, the, the hospitals rent trailers and they, they get rid of them, temporarily put them in trailers off site, and then they, they, they trailer them back, you know, type of deal. But so, you know, I'm being a little snide. So a lot of it's good, not all of it's good. And again, reality is you have these organizations that exist. They do communicate to some extent. And one example is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has very close ties with the Joint Commission. And uh, CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they, they, they basically say one of their conditions of, of uh, participation is you need to be accredited, not necessarily by the Joint Commission, but there was a time when they actually had, they, they gave the Joint Commission statutory authority, if you will, um, which is an unusual measure to give a private organization statutory authority. Um, that's not really the case anymore, but there's this very, there is a very close tie between those two organizations. There's less so for, uh, amongst many of the other health uh, healthcare oversight organizations. Food and Drug Administration, I'm really going to say a lot that, about that. Approval of COVID-19 vaccines. Just keep in mind that, you know, COVID-19 vaccines, that they're really, um, they're still authorized under the, uh, you, know, emerg um, uh, you know, emergency approval. Um, so I, and I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I, I, I think in, in balance, relatively safe, but not without some risks. ARC, I mentioned, so I'm going to actually just kind of, you know, slide through that. Institute of Medicine, I talked about that. This just gives you a better idea. So you had, you know, phase two in the middle of this slide, devise and improvement plan. So the air is human, building a safer uh, healthcare system. But then the phase three from 2001, 2017 and beyond, where they really talk about how do we make it better? We got to produce them, we got a problem. How do we make it better? And they really have some very good uh, insights in, in, in these pieces from, from 01 to 17 and beyond that talk to some of that. And again, you know, you can see them in the 2017 healthcare information technology. So things like meaningful use, where healthcare providers, not just hospitals, but doctors, you know, doctor uh, offices and practices, got rewarded for some of uh, some of um, the the, if you will, technological advancements in info technology, investing in leapfrog groups, consortium of organizations. So if you will, purchasers. Of, uh, of, of institutional healthcare quality um, and, and the services that fall under that umbrella. Represents, uh, it's more than 30, it's about 36 to 40 million Americans today. Um, and what they do is, is they look at these health outcomes and, and, the, and the, these, these scorecards and they will actually direct. So, it, so think of 
ExxonMobil and IBM and all of the big companies and the Leapfrog Group would actually include a lot of them. And they look at who's providing the best care for the most efficient and effective price. Um, and let's give our, you know, let's give our business to them. Joint Commission, I talked about them as well. So again, you know, I go on on survey standards. So have about half of their survey standard tar target uh, patient safety. Um, I'll talk more about the root cause analysis later in this presentation, but some of the tools that they espouse. This is um, on, on administrative burden. This was a piece, again, we got published 2016. We did a little survey, but bottom line is this. If you work home care company, acute care hospital, physician practice, if you feel like you're documenting too much, that you're, you're spending a lot of time reporting on, on your cow or on your computer or on your tablet or device, whatever the case may be, you're not alone. It's not unique to respiratory care. It's not unique to physicians. It's not, we have a couple, I actually, we have another manuscript that, that's in review right now. I'm hoping it, it's, it's gonna have a home. It's so it's, it's really worth it. Really looking at physicians and how much, what they call pajama time, how much they're, you know, you're now home, you ate dinner, you know, husband, wife went to bed and now, now you're actually still going into the computer and you're still working. You know, you're still going into the electronic health record and finishing your notes and things along those lines. So it's, it's across the board. It's not just unique to the United States. It's abroad. I actually got a piece published last summer, or actually this time last year was actually published, which talked about in the Netherlands, you know, the problems that they have there, Germany. So a lot, a lot of uh, healthcare systems in a lot of countries are, are feeling this and a lot of different disciplines, a lot of stuff on nursing and, um, and physicians, less so on uh, in, in respiratory and allied health, but enough to, to say it's, it's real and widespread. So this is just really talking a little bit more uh, uh, um, in, in depth about, okay, well, you know, the United States spends almost 17% of its gross domestic product on healthcare. Switzerland spends about 12. You can read France, Belgium. A lot of them are in that like 10-ish range, you know, 11 to nine-ish range, something along those lines. Um, and, you know, that, that's a lot, but our, the thing that is most significant thing, I think, is not just the difference and not just the difference between us and the next, you know, the, ne the next less, less exorbitant spender, Switzerland. Um, it's also that our gross domestic product, it's a percentage, we're showing a percentage here, is the highest in the world, okay? And it's the highest per capita in the world by a long shot right, type of deal. So it's very, very interesting to look at and say, we're spending the most, but unfortunately, we're not, we're not achieving the best outcomes. This is just a simple depiction. Uh, again, I'm not saying we should judge quality strictly on life expectancy, but it is one, one of the metrics that's looked at. So you actually have United States, the significance is we're spending, you know, upwards approaching, you know, 10,000 per capita. And our life expectancy is crudely, and again, this is the blending male and female, is a little over 78, whereas you have all the others that are in there, including Germany, Canada, that are spending a lot less than us, where they have, you know, considerably higher. Japan, notably so, 83 versus 78 and change for us. And a little bit more here, increasing number of Americans without health insurance. So one of the really good things about the Affordable Care Act is it definitely pushed down the number of uninsureds. The problem is that we've noticed in the past few years, it's been creeping up. Um, and who knows if we go into a recession, what, what could happen there? But there are people, a fair amount of people that do walk around this, this earth and this world, this United States without health insurance, with none. I'm not even talking about med Medicaid, they, with nothing. Um, and it's just, it's a bad, bad thing to do. I, I don't mean to sound judgmental that way, but it, it's bad for them, most particularly bad for their family. We all end up paying, they're, they're gonna get care, but it's gonna be through un, uninsured um, programs, you know, generally funded by the state. So what we're gonna do now, it is uh, almost five minutes before the hour. So it's about seven. Okay, everybody, let's get, uh, continue this presentation, but really kind of gravitate to uh, what I described earlier, and that is to a related term. So uh, healthcare quality is more of the um, relating to the overall uh, facets, if you will, of care delivery and kind of overlapping various strategies, things along those lines. Reliability, um, as I mentioned very early in this presentation, has to do with re repeatability, repeatability. 
And we're not talking about repeating the same mistake over and over again, but really looking at processes that are evidence-based where you know, they, they've kind of not just uh, uh, you know, stood the test of time, but, but even before they were implemented, they were supported by the literature that was actually out there. So let's, let's actually take a, um, again, take a, a deeper examination. So making the case for defining and um, you know, examining reliability, so there's more agreement on the definition of re reliability than quality, just a, just a fact. Um, and again, re reliability is the probability that a system will yield a specific or the same outcome kind of more or less over and over again. Um, the Institute on Healthcare Improvement or the IHI happens to define it, um, not surprisingly so, and not that all different from the definition above in, in, in Webster's is reliability is the measurability or measurable uh, capability of an intended process, procedure, or service to perform its intended function in the required time frame under commonly occurring conditions. And then they go on to elaborate, it's a failure-free operation over time that is measured as the inverse of the system's failure rate, so the success rate, if you will. Well, they, they use the term failure free. I would say that's a little bit dubious because anybody or any process or any organization that you know uh, they, that that is that is described as never failing is probably full of you know what. Okay, but really what they're saying is that the the goal, okay, is zero defects, and it's actually a just for anyone who's interested in this one of the. Um, one of the uh, philosophers, if you will, that espoused this was Philip Crosby. And he understood, so he's like a quality guru. Another, now, I mentioned Don Abadian before, um, there's others as well. Uh, but Philip Crosby, basically, he you know, talked about zero defects, zero errors. And I actually learned about him. I did uh, almost 14 years in the Prudential Insurance Company of America. And I was on a quality committee and I learned all about Philip Crosby. And I used to kind of push back and say, wait a minute though, is it really reasonable to expect zero defects? The point that they're making is that should be the goal. And you may not, you know, you're probably not going to achieve it, but get as close as you can to it. So quality and reliability, it's, you know, and this is, this is the experts say it, but I, for whatever it's worth, I happen to concur completely. They're really inseparable. Um, the lack of reliability contributes to medical errors, inconsistent quality. So you get good quality this week or this day or whatever, and not so much other days. Uh, inefficiencies. Uh, so those are some of the bad things that can happen. Why that reliability is more important than ever, because we have more transparency, uh, public awareness of medical errors and quality, like, you know, you couldn't, you know, like, like, <laughs> like it's nobody's business. Health information technology, what they mean is this. So one of the, uh, one of the things I appreciated early on after we converted to um, electronic health record from a hybrid, mostly manual system, but a hybrid system about almost five years ago, and um, again, more a fan than not, without a doubt, but it, 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 uh, it enables. So having a, a system like uh, Epic or uh, Cerner or, or similar ones, um, it enables the overseers the quality, to more closely oversee you. Okay, <laughs> that, that sounds like a paranoid statement. Really? So they can also they can garner data, but they can actually look at individuals and their quality of their charting. It can just give you, you know, you know run a report, it can give you, you know, your, your charging, how much revenue that you're earning, uh, your productivity, because a, um, a lot of the procedures that respiratory therapists do are not directly billable. Not none of them, but a lot of them are not. But the, the systems capture um, the pro productivity of the uh, individual staff member, the, the, the team, et cetera. Um, so, you know, the health in information technology is really, uh, is, it has supported this whole notion of more transparency. Uh, emergence of quality improvement methodology. So now we're have a better understanding of what works, what doesn't, the context, the environmental factors in which they're more likely to work. Okay, so it's not just, oh, this is better than that. In some cases, it's, you know, it's, if you're, if, if, if you uh, have a patient's coding and if you can uh, ventilate and oxygenate them with a bag valve mask, that's fine. As long as they're not compromising their airway, they're not vomiting or whatever, that's perfectly le legitimate. You, could you put it in an LMA? Absolutely. Could you put it, could you do a, a, an atracheal intubation? Absolutely. So those are the different options that you can actually do, but not, you know, doesn't necessarily, um, you know, there's more than one way to, to, if you will, skin a cat. And back to the Institute of Medicine. So reliability in the Institute of Medicine's aims, 
to look at you know some of the some of the uh, uh, factors involved: timeliness, patient-centeredness, effectiveness. Okay, so this is really you know some of these factors. When you see the the triple aim, it really relates to that. There's actually a fourth leg of this tool um, that I'm starting to read more and more about. Um, you know, our, our first speaker, Gary, he's a fellow uh, in the American College of Healthcare Executives. Uh, he's also a fellow in the American Association of Respiratory Care. Like me, I'm not a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives. I'm, I'm a member, but I actually read I read uh, the journals with great uh, vigor, with great interest. They're talking about uh, the fourth leg relates to us, the providers, the clinicians, and uh, you know our morale level, and you know or the things along those lines. So they're really, you know, now that there's such a shortage and that organizations are spending so much money on travelers agencies and you know, overtime and incentive bonuses and all this other stuff. They're really looking at us, us, us more carefully and saying, hmm, you know, why is this happening? Why are people leaving the profession, et cetera? And, um, you know, better or worse, some of our related lectures, uh, in particular, the ones that, that I'm going to be giving that relate to this whole topic, um, I'll be drilling down on issues like burnout and you know quality of life for for the for the workforce. So you know more to come on that in, in separate lectures. Understanding high reliability organizations. Uh, my uh, discussion topic for my quality course that I'm teaching this semester, but this week's discussion relates to high reliability organizations. So there's certain characteristics that they actually have, um, and I'm not going to you know bore you with all the gory details, but. Um, the, the, really, the goal these high reliability organizations. The goal is to is to um, is to create an infrastructure where um, uh, unintended variation is minimized. Um, and unintended, if there was no variation, we would still be living in caves, eating raw meat, grunting at each other. Okay, so thankfully, there's been variation. We've evolved. Okay, but it, it, as far as in the quality and reliability realm, that un unintended variation is generally the enemy of reliability at the bedside. And they have some examples of, um, of types of industries that really have embraced, they've been early adopters of high reliability uh, principles. Uh, you know, uh, uh, commercial travel, nuclear power, naval aircraft carriers, amusement parks, um, and the like. High reliability con concepts in healthcare. So now really turning the focus there, lo looking at some of the uh, specific um, you know, factors that will contribute to you know, um, high reliability. So sensitivity to operations, preoccupation with failures, um, deference, so really e emphasis on expertise, um, resilience. So things like in, in our business, there's going to be setbacks. Um, there's going to be issues. We saw a lot of things exposed when, when with the first wave of, uh, of COVID. Um, and we actually had to, you know, we improve things, but you will also do some introspection and say, you know, we have to be resilient here. Now, not just in responding to the first wave, but also in, in preparing for subsequent ones and preparing for not just the COVID um, and, and, and the various, the variants that have, that have occurred, but also um, in preparing for other, if you will, natural occurrences, natural disasters and things along those lines. And the reluctance to simplify, devils in the details. So really a lot of these processes are, are complex. Um, you know, there, it, it's kind of funny because some of the, the lean philosophy that I'll be talking about aims to simplify, okay, to, to, to get rid of unnecessary steps, okay. What they're really saying, though, with high reliability organizations is don't carry it too far, okay. Don't think that, you know, you can just get rid of uh, steps. And in one of my cases, I'll talk about reducing steps. And it was in, in balance, it was, a, it was a good thing, but it was also something that really needed to be examined in, in the context context of are we losing anything by, by, by minimizing these steps. Tools, so some of the tools that we'll look at, um, you know, systems thinking, the culture of quality and safety, you know, so cultures and pattern of shared assumptions, organization, values, beliefs, behaviors that have been taught and to the world. Taught is, taught it infers that like you were like in a classroom being taught or whatever, but it's, a, it's the way things are done in an organization. It's, it's the, um, if you will, the, the, the um, openness, the openness or lack thereof to do, you know, self-criticism um, and self-introspection and, and examining, you know, closely, you know, can we do things better without it being, you know, a blame game. Um, reliability is also supported by data and, you know, data in many forms, but most notably through the electronic health record. Uh, continuous quality improvement, 
I'll talk very briefly about Plan Do Study Act um, and some of the others here. You know, uh, Six Sigma Lean. I, I alluded to a couple of slides earlier, saying it's really want to want to eliminate unnecessary steps to to, to have a process be um, when I say as simple as simple as practical as as makes sense and a root cause analysis, which we'll um, also examine. Systems thinking. So really, you know, I mentioned um, in, in the first part of this lecture relating more to quality, that really then you're looking at, well, what affects what, when that, you know, therapist who's left alone in the unit who has one year experience and just got off of, of orientation and doesn't have a resource person, you got to expect that something bad is going to happen there, particularly in a busy ICU. Um, so most problems with quality and reliability are rooted in shortcomings of systems and processes. The systems include the organizational culture. They include a lot of things, by the way. And I only listed a few of them here. Resources, physical facilities, equipment, manpower, training, policies, protocols, lions and tigers and bears on mine. Um, if a clinician makes a mistake because they did not have the resources to succeed, you know, like, like I alluded to, then systems in which they operate should be the main focus for improvement. And the oxygen tubing uh, mix up, I'll, I'll, I'll drill down more in the cases I have at the end of this presentation. I just want to kind of manage our time most appropriately. So applying, you know, kind of looking more closely at this high reliability concepts in healthcare, and then, you know, joint commission requirement, you know, create, maintain a culture of safety. By the way, changing a corporate culture is one of the most difficult things to do. It's possible. But it doesn't happen like over, over a second. It usually happens over months and years, just to be clear on this. And they're really talking about, okay, well, what are, the, what are some of the steps? So you're looking at increasingly informed, that, that is your, your workforce, your staff, increasing trust and accountability. And, you know, some of the, so some of the starting off, you know, that it's pathological, you know, who cares as long as we don't get caught? So that's like, that's a bad place to be. Reactive, safety is important. We do a lot every time we have an accident or make a mistake. All right? So that's reacting. So calculating, we have systems in place to manage all hazards. And again, you know what I said earlier about all, all anything. Okay, what they're saying is that we have to deal with some of them. Being proactive, safety, leadership, um, values, drives, continuous quality improvement, and then really looking at, you know, uh, a gener you know ge generative. So, you know, it's how we do business around here. It's just, we just are, it's the way we think. You know, some, some um, respiratory care departments and, you know, some, you know, home care agencies, the respiratory department, they, they just team up. They just get stuff done. They're a team. They're a, a, a well, not just oiled, but they care about each other. They have mutual respect, et cetera. Uh, they, they don't go to, to lunch until everybody's caught up, you know, and that's just the way they roll. It's the way they roll. Other places, you know, and obviously there's stuff in the middle, but other places it's every man for himself, you know, and, and you know, when you get busy, sometimes you just got to get food and gobble down. You can't wait. You can't wait. Type of deal. But there, and there's all kinds of variations. Um, that exist as well. But you think about, you know, you know, helping each other have a generative. It's like, well, I, you know, um, uh, I'm fairly busy, but I got a little time. I can help somebody else out. And it's, one of my things is, you know, it's always been one of my things when I, was, when I was a lead therapist. It's, you know, when you have time, you surely, you know, take time to go to the bathroom, get, get you know, hydrate, eat, whatever. But when you've done all that stuff and you kind of like caught up, think to yourself, what else can I be doing in my unit? Or what else can I be doing to help somebody else out? That's what th those are the kinds. That's the kind of thinking that uh, high reliability organizations uh, embrace. Cultural quality. So some of those particular, you know, uh, uh, components. Leadership. You know, uh, thinking, strate uh, strategizing, communicating. So leadership. Really, we're talking about the high level, the C-suite, the directors and up. Management. You know, assistant managers, managers, maybe even supervisors. So communicating, executing, monitoring. And they're really talking about. Um, you know, some of these the sub bullets on their management, the one that's bolded is de-emphasize blame and punishment and accentuate improvement and excellence. What some organizations do is they say that better than they actually, um, than they actually um, practice it, okay? And one of the examples is uh, not to pick on Vanderbilt uh, Medical Center um, in Tennessee, but you know, one of the things is you had that nurse who did the drug mix up and it was, a, it was a terrible thing what happened, but you know, she got convicted. I, I, you know, she was she was charged, uh, criminally charged, which was unprecedented. And you know, it should be interesting to see, you know, with an appeal and that sort of thing. But it was just like, wait a minute, you know, it was it was an egregious mistake, but she admitted it. it was, she was not really high. It was an egregious mistake. Um, but you know, there, there were systems, there was process and systems elements to that as well. By the way, 
So you know, I could go down that rabbit hole, but I think some organization, it wasn't Acme Hospital, it was Vanderbilt, okay? Vanderbilt Medical Center. So it was like one of those, you know, very, very well regarded and even the best regarded can, they can screw up too, but. Culture of quality, some of the other components, you know, the organization is aligned from top to bottom. Boy, that's like, that's like Nirvana, you know, organization is, is aligned. Or a or, 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 or CEO, um, of the organization, not of the hospital, came into the ICU after COVID. And he, he did, he came in. He literally came in, zipped around with a couple of other, uh, you know, uh, executives. And it was just like, it was just, it wasn't aligning. You know, it was just like, it was like, let me get out of here as soon as I possibly can. I just want to be able to say I went to the board of trustees that I went to the unit, you know, whatever. It was just, I don't know. It was no alignment there. It wasn't. Um, people uh, know why, why behind it. Say everything. There's times, by the way, and I know I have everything. There's times when it, it appropriately needs to be kept confidential. It, very good reason. But what they're saying here is where that's not the case, the, 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 the people, the stakeholders should know why, why we're embracing this, uh, this new uh, electronic health record, why the templates look like they do. And hopefully we've had a say in beta testing those templates and say, no, these templates suck. <laughs> they're redundant. They're unintuitive. They're, they're, they're clunky. Okay. I will tell you, I'm very proud to say I work for Atlantic Healthcare. Very proud. It's a good organization. Okay. I will also tell you this and anyone's, you know, Atlantic, that's fine. You know, it's fine. I'm very proud. Very proud. They do a lot of things really, really well. Okay. Our templates were not vetted properly. And only four years later, they're pretty decent. They're now the way they should have been when we implemented them. And it was just like, they finally reduced the redundancy. They finally made them more intuitive. They finally, they finally, they finally, but it was a failure of leadership and, and they don't fail at many things. That, that's really the good news. So um, leaders are well-trained uh, and able to cascade the training to their staff. Again, easier said than done. Um, everyone practice safe, uh, spe spe practices specific behaviors pro proven to get results. Uh, hard to do when you're short staffed all the time. So that's the that's the goal. People are held accountable, okay? And it means you know, you're know you held accountable, but not necessarily uh, punished. Processes are standardized across the organization. The organization is geared to innovate, you know, you know invest in, in the appropriately invest in technology. Some of the uh, survey uh, elements, if you will, uh, of a, a, a you know, patient safety uh, uh, culture, uh, staff perception on aspects of patient safety culture. So, you know, uh, raise uh, uh, staff awareness about patient safety. These are some of the actual, you know, the, the aims, if you will. Um, diagnose and assess the, the current uh, status of the patient safety culture. You know, identify strengths, examine trends, uh, evaluate cultural impact, um, and conduct uh, internal and ex external comparisons to see, to see how your organization weighs into uh, in comparison to similar ones. Another um, concept related to both quality, but more particularly reliability is, uh, is data. Um, get me the data. Our, our chief medical officer who actually left recently, but he was a big data guy. I was like a fan. I was like, you know, how can you, you know, so one of my other colleagues uh, who's an associate dean at, at the school I teach at Rutgers basically says, you can't manage what you can't measure. So I'm like, yeah, good, yeah, exactly. And that may apply to you. You know, you can't manage your finances if, you're, if you don't know what the budget is. Okay, if you're if you're spending more, you need to see where the money's going. Okay, so it could apply to you as an individual. It could well apply to an organization. It can apply, you know, more uh, discreetly to the department or to a team or that sort of thing. But you can't manage what you can't measure. Data, looking at clinical quality, financial performance, physician, patients, and uh, staff satisfaction. You know, family satisfaction. By the way, we know now that there's a close relationship between Physician among among physician staff and patient satisfaction. So it's, not, it's, not, it's not a perfect alignment, but there's a close relationship. That uh, uh, you know, there's a saying: happy happy wife, happy life. I'm a man. I'm a married man. So was, uh, Terry and I were just talking about this the other day. Doesn't mean you got to always say yes to your wife, but you know, there's something to be said for it. If if you're on the fence, you know, and you know, I made the mistake a few times. You just kind of live and learn. You're like nah, nah, you know, whatever. So, so the point of it is, so there's the close association there. If your wife's happy, you're happy. If your husband's happy, you know, you're, you're happier, let's just say. But likewise, if, you know, your staff, your physician have, patients tend to be happier as well. Functional status, looking at, you know, functional status as well. I mentioned productivity before, that may be it. where well, you can't charge for a, a uh, an activity, a diagnostic or a therapeutic activity, but you can still 
you could still, if you will, account for that's how you spent your time. So you can justify your staffing. Source of data, EHRs or EMRs, they're not exactly the same thing. We're not gonna go into the difference, but they're not they're, they're close enough where we could use them inter interchangeably today. Perspective data collection, data collection forms, scanners, administrative databases, lions and tigers and bears. So you kind of get patients, uh, patient survey, satisfaction, functional status as well. They use some of like, also to, to be clear, um, even things like quality of life surveys. So, you know, asthmatics, you have junipers, quality of life survey. So they actually look at quality of life, you know, not just the clinical uh, component. They, you know, some organizations look at quality of life um, of their, their, their staff, you know, what, what is the work-life balance like? Um, it is really interesting that um, a lot of, you know, I'll talk more about that in my, you know, impact on the workforce um, lecture, a, a different but related lecture. But it's, it's amazing how the data is pretty strong to say that, you know, it's, it's important to monitor, you know, things like burnout, um, things like job related stress, but it's, it, and we, you know, it's, it's a good thing to monitor and it's a good thing, so the better thing to even respond to create uh, environments that where there's greater work life balance and less stress. Um, the problem is a lot of organizations, strikingly few will focus on measuring that in particular and then responding appropriately. Organizations tend to be, 10, not all, they tend to be slow to respond to this stuff. So you know, you have the HR people are scratching their heads saying, I can't understand why I can't get people coming in, you know, whatever. Well, you know, you're you're some organizations are more, you know, they're more heady. They're paying certain, they're paying more, they're, you know, retention bonuses, they're more aggressive with recruiting, they're doing non- non-financial uh, 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 rewards such as, you know, maybe CE or quasi CEU programs, education programs, you know, you know, whatever, just better benefits, things along those lines. And, and others are just kind of flopping along and just doing things more or less the way they always did them. And, you know, it's just, it matters, you know, the workforce is feeling, you know, kind of underappreciated. So just something to kind of keep in, in mind that, that that affects your, your, clinician satisfaction, which can affect your patient surveys. Continuous quality improvement, simply put, it's not simple, but simply put, it is looking at your structure, your process, your outcomes, so the Donna Bainian thing, and looking at, and then the outcomes and monitoring the outcomes and saying, okay, where are we, where's it look like we're going, on? okay. Doesn't mean you're doing everything perfectly if the outcomes are good. You could be doing, you, it could have been things canceled each other out. Some of the good stuff canceled some of the bad stuff out and you ended up with decent outcomes, okay? But what you really want to focus is where those outcomes are not good. That, that's really a starting point. And you, you know, seeking to answer how are we doing, where can we do better, always. You know, it's something that, that I, I uh, was with students today and something that I've been teaching uh, for almost 27 or 28 years. Um, very blessed to, to teach for 27 or 28 years. And I, I, I say proudly that I'm a better teacher now than what I was last year and five years ago and 10 years ago. I'm not perfect. I, I love teaching. And it's not, it's not an ego thing. It's because I, I love seeing the people that the succession, I love to see the, uh, be a part of developing people who are going to take my job, damn it, and probably do better than I'll do it. You know, it's really cool. And to advance our profession, like Gary was talking about. And um, I, I you know, could go on and on, but it really, think about the CQI, it's embracing it, not in an organizational sense, but in saying, how can I even do a better job of helping educate these students so that when they graduate, you know, you get it. The uh, plan, you know, plan, do, study, act. So, you know, plan, develop, you know, develop the, the initiative, you know, implement it, understanding that, you know, maybe you want to implement it, you know, on a very localized controlled basis, even beta testing it, um, you know, seeing how you're small scale first study, you know, check the results, analyze the data, and then act, make further improvements. So it's, you know, it's, this is like magnet, you know, nursing, they really kind of embrace this, you know, you don't have to, that doesn't necessarily need to be the, you know, PDSA, but you'll see it on a lot of the posters and a lot of the nursing journals, it, 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 it's spoken, um, doesn't have to be again, th this exact acronym, but the process is really, should be the focal point. Some tools in action. So newly adopted electronic health record system permits RTs to acknowledge medications. And it, you could substitute, you know, if there's any nurses in the audience, you know, RNs instead of RTs uh, as they give them or or to do the entire shift, at, uh, you know, entire uh, medication uh, entourage at the end of the shift. As a result, RT practices vary in this regard. 
So based on you know the the plan do study uh, act approach, the open endedness of the process was deemed in, in, you know, inappropriate, major contributor to excessive variation. Some of the steps, you know, open endedness of plan was a contributor to variation. The do policy to record all medications at given time or in a time range, let's say, was instituted. Adherence was studied. You know, and again, there may be some legitimate, you know, basically it was just, you just ran around for, you know, eight hours and there was no way that you could record all that. So, there, you know, there, there can be some variation there just as long as it's the exception and not, you know, the rule. And then the template was modified in order to um, accommodate it. Some other, uh, the lean, some lean uh, focuses on removal, minimizing waste. So it's the steps that are wasteful. It's not just simplifying for the sake of simplifying. Um, looks to make processes smoother, alleviate, you know, any sort of, you know, overburden um, and the need for uh, the customer comes first. Um, and some of the steps you identified, you know, value um, from a patient's perspective. And you could argue patient, you know, slash stakeholders perspective, um, identify value stream, identify steps, activities that contribute to value, create a set of activities, improve the actual workflow leadership should it, it, it ensure uh, identified activities are implemented smoothly, easier said than done. There's, you know, a lot of these, a lot of this is resource intensive. Test the process or pilot with a few patients. If it's a patient process, get feedback, perfect the process. Maybe that's too strong, but enhance the process with the goal of, you know, um, you know, done is better than perfect, but with the goal of, of trying to at least aspire, you know, uh, uh, something that, that approaches perfection. Six Sigma really has to do with um, the whole variation. Six Sigma is really a core tool with reliability, just to be clear on that. And it aims to reduce variation, eliminate defects and processes. So the you know, a combination of statistical analysis, quality management um, methods or tools as well. Main goal, again, reduce uh, waste and um, eliminate or minimize errors. And then these the actual components of it uh, define you know, the process the outcome to be uh, improved um, and the key characteristics track performance. So one of the things that you see is I'm throwing a lot of these tools at you. It's like, oh man, you think about it. Okay. Really defining. So let's just for a second, take a step back from specifically from Six Sigma. Let's look at all of these. What do they have in common? Okay. You want to define what are the goals? Where are the problem areas? Where are the goals? Okay. You want to actually you know, identify and implement measures that are likely to to uh, be able to achieve those goals or you know, closer than where you are. Then you need to actually you know, measure, track the performance via data collection and analyze it. Uh, are we on the right track? Okay, so we haven't eliminated, but we're reducing these errors. Uh, and then it constantly, even if you are on the right track, how can we, if you will, um, uh, enhance the trajectory and get there sooner? So develop uh, solutions to make changes in the process, adjust as necessary and control and constantly, once you really have a process that you think is pretty darn good, controlling it to make sure that it's still, um, that it, you know, you're know you still on track and being aware that your, your environment, your external environment is gonna change. So being in control today, you may not be as, as in control in six months once the legislation changes. One of the things that's going on right now in healthcare is CMS and other oversight organizations are emphasizing the carbon footprint of healthcare organizations. Just to, I'm just tipping my hand here. It has not been a main focal point. It will be, I don't want to say a main focal point. It'll take a much greater precedence. Um, American College Healthcare Executives, but, but they're real, they do a nice job of summarizing some of the rationale. Things that I didn't know about until fairly recently. Uh, uh, you know, anesthetic gases are, are, are very bad for the environment, just to let you know. So, you know, so it's, it's, it's you know, healthcare, accounts for a dis the industry a disproportionately high percentage of you know if you will uh, uh, you know carbon and um, impact on the environment so I could go on and on about that but so you're going to see some of these you know six sigma you're going to see some of these quality um, tools not just applied to you know reliability but also applied to some of these other initiatives that are um, really kind of on the on the near horizon. So some of the uh, lean thinking in action. So ABC Clinic, and uh, this is a lot, a lot of words here, but the thing you got to recognize is this. They had 14 steps. So uh, a patient flow uh, to, you know, 
a COVID uh, pandemic. So in the past, the processes, and again, I'm not to read every person, but patient arrives, signs at the reception desk, when they're called, you have a, a patient service representative, patient fills out paperwork, you get the idea, okay? And by all means, you know, these, these presentations will be posted, but there was a lot of steps. They hurried up and waited. Okay, they fill out the form and then they sat back down. And then, or, or COVID, they went out to their car or whatever the case may be. But they, you know, some of this was automated. The point of it is, is that it was 14 steps that based on lean principles was reduced to five. Okay. And again, well aware that when you're looking at some of the high reliability principles, they say, don't oversimplify. So you got to kind of have that, you know, be balancing, don't oversimplify, but simplify where you can. The fishbone diagram and whether you actually do it using a fishbone diagram, such as on the right hand side of, of this slide, or you do it more conceptually. Okay. And you say, what were some of the, you know, major, major categories? What were the, you know, looking at the right, the, uh, the, the left side of this, um, this slide, you know, making look, equipment. What were the contributing when it came to equipment? Processes and methods. What were the contributing factors, you know, regarding people and materials and environment and, and et cetera? Root cause analysis, recreate the event, who, what, when, where, how, debrief, what factors contributed, you know, and these are not mutually exclusive. You can do a root cause analysis and you use a fishbone diagram concomitantly, you know, simultaneously. Devise the results summary, what happened, who was involved, causes and prevention, implement the plan. What is not included here, but you, you know, is, is inferred is, then you'd monitor. Did the, you know, is the plan effective in reducing, I would say eliminate, but realistically reducing um, the, the occurrence uh, and reducing the severity when it does occur, the, the implications. Some of these other uh, tools in action. So let's, let's take a look. Um, root cause analysis, non-invasive uh, facial sore. So the issue uh, identified. Again, who was it? When I did home care 30 years ago, it was like, oh, patient's got facial breakdown. Oh, that's too bad. Let's just look for another mask. Now it's really recognized this is not a good thing. This was you know, a, this facial breakdown, particularly in a hospital or in a, like a LTAC, doesn't occur in five hours. Okay, it's something that occurs over time. Didn't anybody pick this up before you had, you know, as this gentleman, as this picture shows, before you had a, you know, one and a half or one inch, you know, sore that actually looks like it's actually starting to heal, but it's from a, it's from a non-invasive uh, interface. So, you know, you know, fishbone diagram, you know, some of the the elements, you know, equipment, better non-invasive masks. Skin barriers, such as they use uh, some, uh, we use these gecko pads, they're like gel pads. The, you know, I'm not promoting them per se, but just some sort of a barrier there to, to cushion the skin. People, RT is not aware of the risks nor the consequences. The process of purchasing department, purchase of more expensive, so, you know, they're, they're, they're looking to, they're not asking us many times, well, what do you think about this, this interface or this mask? They're not necessarily doing that. They're doing other stuff and really looking at what's the, what's the, you know, what, 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 how can we get the most of the most number, the highest number of these masks to the cheapest price? Um, so that's kind of a constant back and forth. And you can make the case, listen, these masks don't work. This is why they don't work. Causes, causes this to happen on too many patients. The action plan. So, you know, again, well, like I said, when I did home care 30 years ago, eh, we got a little big on some, now it's a big deal. And educating us as clinicians to say, this is a bigger deal than just Patients got a mark on their face where they have some breakdown or they got a sore on the bridge of their nose or their cheek or whatever. So it's really educating the staff, you know, on, you know, the significance, what it means. It means that if we have enough of these ca cases like this, that we're not going to get reimbursed and we're going to get dinged from the standpoint of reimbursement. So it's bad for the patient because they have, you know, from a, from a, a health perspective and maybe a cosmetic perspective, but it's also bad for us because we could get dinged for it. Okay. And then, then also educating what options are out there switching a patient in nasal pills, using a better interface. Then the process, again, looking at educating purchasing on the consequences of cheaper masks. And, and we say educating them is really making the case. So to educate them, but really convince them. The way you're going to convince them is say, listen, one of these occurrences costs the hospital X. So in other words, we could buy 400 masks because it costs us X, Y, and Z. And God forbid if it's a lawsuit, okay? I don't think people are going to necessarily sue because of a sore on the bridge of the nose, but for some other event, they might. A cheaper mask and a patient uh, aspirates and vo uh, vomits and aspirates, and then they have some, you know, a bad occurrence after that. You know, you could see a lawsuit coming from something like that. Equipment, better masks, uh, use protocols, 
Um, and the protocol would include when this does happen is that, um, you know, you take some action to mitigate it and you inform uh, wound care, um, you know, to, to get involved as soon as possible. So now let's look at some cases here, about a half a dozen or seven cases, whatever, and then we'll come down to home stretch. So each of the acute care facilities within a five hospital system have somewhat different protocols for treating COVID-19 patients. And really what we're talking about is in the first wave. So we're talking about now, it's not quite three years, but it's two years and whatever, seven, eight, nine months, whatever, um, is looking, looking at, um, you know, with acute, severe, hypoxemic, oxygenation, respiratory failure. Some facilities employ a treatment known as high flow nasal cannula, to help prevent intubation, mechanical ventilation, et cetera. Um, with some success. Some facilities do not, citing un, un, some unsubstantiated potential exposure. And I'd say um, largely unsubstantiated. So intuitively you'd think, and, I, and I've talked to my, um, my clinicians, we did not use a lot of high flow at my facility, okay? We didn't use any in, 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 up until fairly recently, okay? But I've also talked to clinicians who worked at facilities that did, that got sick, okay? And so, yeah largely un or under substantiated potential exposure to us when you use you know high flow nasal cannula other differences among facilities and treating some patients include vastly different clinician uh, patient loads policies uh, regarding cohorting non-cohorting etc cetera, etc cetera. okay this actually happened okay five hospital system there was great variability um Lack of co uh, a collaboration, communication. What one of the problems that they actually identified was, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, was they um, they did not have a director who oversaw the respiratory at all of the sites. Okay, so lack of collaboration and communication among sites, a failure of high level leadership uh, to create a, a, a structure to promote such collaboration. The list could go on. I'm quite honest, these weren't the only two issues. Um, there was also a, a debrief. There was also a lack of data on what was effective with these patients. So it wasn't anybody's fault. It's just like it wasn't out there. The action plan create structure and process for ongoing collaboration was a big deal. Five late, uh, five site practice council, a director, literally a director level czar overseeing the respiratory at all sites, including you know COVID care. Uh, review what research exists in uh, clinical best practices, collaboratively decide on um, consistent policies and procedures, monitor adherence, modify as appropriate. Ventilator patient checklist. So one of the things that I implemented is I was concerned that um, the, the big things were getting done, but a lot of the circuit changes, changing Hollister uh, 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 ET tube devices, um, setting alarm ventilator alarms properly, and, and the like, and the like wasn't happening. So quality audit reveal. So I kind of took that that um, initiative that I really spearheaded and kind of turned it into a case. It's not literal. But quality audit didn't reveal it, honestly. Um, could have, but didn't. Reveal inconsistencies in practices when RTs are performing ventilator patient checks um, at the old ICU 700 bed hospital. Uh, that pretty much describes the hospital I work in. The, the trend uh, had worsened with increased use of agency staff, less familiar, and frankly, you know, increased use of new hires, less experienced folks um, was, with such uh, policy protocols, et cetera. These inconsistencies include how to conduct spontaneous breathing trials, how and when, yeah, when and how. Um, alarm setting threshold, as well as intervals, circuit changes, blah, blah, blah. So insufficient standardization, inadequate um, training and education, lack of tools to help staff adhere to these guidelines. I was with a uh, agency orientee on Tuesday and I, you know, very shortly after we got there, I, I gave her this and said, listen, I'll fill in the blanks. We did a couple of vent patient checks together uh, and then we divided and conquered, and then I went back and reviewed her stuff, you know, whatever. It was the best that we can do because we're, we're extraordinarily busy and we're a hiring agency for a reason. Um, but basically, um, we um, lo looked at the policies and procedures. Are these really most reflective of best practices? We enhanced staff training on the patient management. Um, give, we, have, we have live lectures. We have ones we recorded. I actually gave one um, fairly recently on patient safety in mechanical ventilation. I gave it to the staff at at, at, at the five hospital system, also gave it at our state uh, conference last week. Um, and, and I'll be giving it uh, a version of it, a version of it um, in up, upcoming events um, in, in you know, the, the end of this year and beyond. Create effective tools such as ventilator pa patient checklist, monitor ongoing training um, and, and the like needs. And just to give you a little snippet, 
So this is not the entire event patient checklist, but this is a, about a 20 item checklist, but this gives you an idea, you know, label vent circuit when you actually change and we change it every seven days, you know, or sooner if it's overtly soiled. Uh, label uh, date to be changed, you know, uh, inline uh, suction wiper catheter, change it every three days or sooner. So we use the wiper cast is, would be actually the tube scraper. So you really, you know, scraping the, in, you know, wiping or scraping the internal lumen to get the biofilm or most of the biofilm out of the, uh, out of the um, artificial airway. Date the ET tube holder with these vent, vent, uh, patient checklists, inspect skin. So that's what we're talking about uh, under around. I actually do some uh, legal consulting and the, the uh, one, not the case I'm on now, but the case I did earlier this year, it was all about ET tube not being rotated and um, the patient's tongue basically turned into a canoe. Many more factors involved, by the way, many, many more factors, but they linked it in. He was a very sick man, he had poor dentition. He was on vasopressors, you know, whatever. So it was very high risk. But the point of it was they were able to show that that tube was not rotated appropriately per their policies. Uh, ET tubes uh, should be repositioned, a, a kind of related issue. Um, assess suitability for AMS spontaneous, so you know, spontaneous breathing trial, SBT, and begin as appropriate. And then, you know, looking at if it was due to uh, too much um, sedation, but the patient is improving clinically, then, you know, actually circling around and having them, um, you know, uh, try it again on a spontaneous breathing trial later that morning or early afternoon and things along those lines. So I probably drilled down a little more deeply on this than I intended to, but you get the idea. And, you know, you, so it's not just eight, but it was like, again, 19 or 20 items. Newer mode of ventilation. So medium-sized 375 bed hospital recently uh, began or has begun using airway pressure release ventilation due to the, the uh, demand of a newly hired ICU medical director. However, one month after implementation, they found that the patients on APRV have lingered longer. It didn't, didn't work. Okay. And again, I'm not anti-APRV. There's, there's mixed evidence to support it, but I'm probably more in favor for the appropriate patient. So really debrief included evaluating RT's knowledge of the comfort level when setting up, maintaining, and weaning. That's really the key. It's not just, can I set it up? It's based on blood gas. Can I, can I you know, appropriately you know, maintain and adjust? And then can I wean the patient in a you know, drop and stretch manner where they end up basically on pressure support with, uh, with CPAP or P? Identify knowledge and comfort gaps and address them and set up the communication collaboration channels with the new I ICU medical director. We need your help. That we, 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 it's not just going to be a two-week thing. We need your help, and we want you to be part of the, the solution, if you will. Action plan, review the latest evidence, set up training, a formal training, uh, formal but structured. That's not going to be formal, but structured training and education program, gauge the medical director, set up a system for ongoing monitor and monitoring education and training. So it's not just, you know, if you don't normally work in the adult ICU, you work in PEDS and you're put in there, hopefully there's some sort of resource uh, mechanisms there for you so that you, you know, you used APRV, you know, nine months ago, we haven't used it since. Uh, new hires, you know, people that can't rotate in from other facilities and the like. Oxygen tubing or uh, gas tubing uh, mix up. This actually happened um, at my facility like 22 years ago. But what happened, I'm, I'm not going to read this slide to you, but what happened was there was a, um, a three year old that came in with his dad. Um, in respiratory distress, um, was getting a breathing treatment. I think the tubing popped off of the nebulizer. Um, the, the, the ER was busy. It was in the ER. The ER was busy. So the therapist went next door to you know, do something with another patient. The resident physician who was there, resident physician, training physician, um, went in and connected the tubing that popped off the nebulizer to the patient's IV and the kid died immediately. You know, the doctor, the father was said something, got a couple of words out, like, are you sure that? And the kid was dead. Gave him a massive, an air embolism that size acts as a clot. Uh, so uh, the kid's eyes rolled back in his head and that was all she wrote. Um, so it was, a, it was a huge deal. They really looked at, you know, so it's very easy to say, well, that, you know, that therapist shouldn't have left, but let's face it, busy ER, you cannot sit there and stay with the, with the patient necessarily. Um, if it's, you know, if you're, if, if you're there and you're manning the ER and, you know, there's three patients in, let's say, pediatric ER that need treatment, you're going to be kind of rotating around amongst them. Um, but they looked at how did the resident even end up, how, what was their education and training like where they knew so little about these systems? How would the 
um, if you will, the connectors even, even remotely adaptable, connectable. So they really looked at a lot of this stuff. Obviously, there was a lot of changes that were made. Um, I'm not embarrassed to share this with you. It's just, and I, and it, it's a really a it's a really good organization and facility. But you know, we make mistakes too. So you know, looked at a lot of the facets beyond. Oh, uh, the resident physician screwed up. The nurse, you know, screwed up. The respiratory therapist screwed up. It was really more of how can we you know make this thing better. Unit dose confusion. So this one simply looks at um, the issue of. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still one of these people that's amazed that these two, um, you know, when you, when you pick up a, a unit dose of albuterol and a unit dose of atropine, they look pretty much the same, you know, more or less, they look the same. You got to really look on the, the embossed um, stuff that's on the label there, uh, but they look pretty much the same. And you say, well, I did my atropine instead of albuterol. We have had a few patients that actually are allergic to the preservative, believe it or not, in, um, in the albuterol unit doses from a particular manufacturer. I'm not gonna mention the manufacturer um, and they were actually given the wrong stuff. Um, so the patient did not die. So, you know, the patient did not, did not die. But it's just, you know, it just amazes me. When Zopinex was kind of big, um, they had the X kind of, it was actually kind of right at the top of it when you twist it off. But it just interests me that, you know, there's, there's, they, haven't, they haven't, you know, altered things along those lines. Barcoding certainly matters, but then sometimes, I mean, today, well, my students and I were giving um, a Pomacort, and I'll tell you right now, the Pomacort that we they had today, usually it's just an individual unit dose that you can defoil. This was five doses per foil. And so you could still, you still had to pull one out, okay? And it was just, uh, yeah, you get the idea. Ventilator failure. So just to be clear on this, as much as, um, as, much as you, you may have trouble believing it, Patients are sometimes put on ventilators that are not turned on, that are not turned on. Um, it happens very, very rarely, but that, it, it does happen, just to be abundantly clear. Um, in this particular case, the vent was on, but it wasn't plugged in, so it was, it was operating on battery power. Uh, patient was, was put on it. They're getting oxygenated and ventilated. Um, the thing's alarming. Nobody's responded to the alarm. Maybe it's in the PACU and then the battery dies and the patient, patient dies as well. So it's, uh, it, it, it happens. Ventilator alarms uh, represent a, when uh, the, the Joint Commission will publish um, medical errors and the most common ones and ventil <laughs> ventilator alarms appear um, usually uh, somewhere in the top 20, you know, eight, eight, 10, 12, 14th, something, not, not one or two, but they often appear. Some issue with vent alarms, some issue, the remote alarm was left out, the vent alarms were, were somehow uh, dis disabled. There was a home ventilator and, the, and the, the, the caregiver taped over the, the speaker so that they could sleep at night and get a good night rest while you know, the patient was suffocating or whatever, because they were disconnected. Um, so let's take a look now at some of the, you know, as we come down the home stretch in this overall presentation some of the, um, what healthcare quality and reliability may look like in the future. So the, the, the National Quality Forum has moved to streamline and truncate reporting, okay? What happens and still today is that healthcare organizations and hospitals will report some of the same data to many different oversight organizations. And the National Quality Forum is saying, listen, let's get to a point where the hospitals report the quality data into a repository and the oversight organizations, either a report is automatically generated or the, the um, oversight organizations go into that repository and pluck out what they need um, to truncate. Uh, another, uh, uh, if you will, uh, move is transition to population health. So, you know, have healthy behaviors, you know, expanding uh, a pay for performance incentives to, you know, when someone's discharged to keep them out of the hospital uh, in, in as healthy a condition as possible, um, to do a lot in terms of community outreach. You know, your not-for-profit uh, hospitals, they, they have to, in order to have that not-for-profit status, they actually have to um, do a certain amount, a certain meet a certain threshold uh, of uh, community outreach and community programs. Uh, increasing the use of evidence-based practices uh, to provide health services, push for coordinated care. So we, we have this uh, accountable care organizations, which, you know, I'm going to oversimplify them and say, that's like, you know, your hospital, uh, three hospital system is now affiliated with, 
you know, uh, formally, formally affiliated with um, some LTACs and some skilled nursing facilities, home care agencies, outpatient dialysis, et cetera, and the, uh, pulmonary, perhaps pulmonary rehab and, and, and others. And the idea there is um, to achieve what's called shared savings. So continuity of care achieves some shared uh, savings and that savings can be shared, returned back to the accountable care organization. Um, there's some evidence to say there's been some success stories and some not so success stories. Um, advancement in technology, so te telehealth, tele telemedicine, mobile health, uh, health IT centers for uh, consumers. Um, telemedicine, telehealth is, is a big deal. Uh, Gary had mentioned the telehealth in the context of um, pulmonary rehab. There's some good data out there. I did a, another presentation on uh, research, you know, updates on research and respiratory care, and it, it's been out there for a bit. Um, and some of those platforms, the, the um, pulmonary rehab platforms, that are digitized uh, where the patient does not have to go to a place. There's, there's some disadvantages, but the, there's some huge advantages. Disadvantages is, you know, patient still needs to be doing physical activity and they need to have certain, you know, certain equipment, not a lot. Um, they need to have compatible uh, computer or device systems and things along those lines, but overall they're pretty, pretty well received. And high, highly or high reliable uh, organizations will have a better chance of success because in having a high reliability organization, they're gonna be able to better, not just adopt these uh, the, and enhance these technologies that we know about, but also um, if you will adjust and tack to uh, what's gonna happen for the future. So summary of key points coming down the home stretch, few industries are as complex, uh, dynamic, heavily regulated and high risk as health, healthcare. Those factors result in varying definitions of quality. They result in a lot of things, by the way. They should result in the higher exposure to making errors. So it's, you know, varying definitions of quality and a lot of other things. However, there's some key elements in, in healthcare quality and reliability that most would agree upon. You know, quality and reliability are indeed inseparable. They're not the same thing, but they're, they're joined at the hip, kind of. Um, there's also some fundamental strategies for managing quality, maximizing reliability that have been supported by the research and some of those, you know, that we, we've talked about. You know, unfortunately, you know, several of the ones I've described is, uh, you know, the, the fishbone, you know, root cause analysis is, oh shit, it, you know, it happened. You know, now, now what? Now we got we to gotta help, you know, help prevent it from happening again. So some of them are, you know, quant the reactive, you could argue that there's a proactive uh, component to it that, you know, they're really looking at the future and changing things. Um, but, you know, really what you're talking about is proactivity, you know, culture of quality, you know, population health, where you're doing community outreach uh, and trying to ensure that patients are as healthy as possible so they don't, they don't have to, you know, utilize services. They can have a higher quality of life. When patients get sick, it's not just bad for our healthcare system. It's bad for, pro it's, bad, it's, it's bad for them because they don't feel well, okay? It's bad for their family members because they empathize. They want the, their family member to feel better, but it's also bad for productivity. And so it's not just that, you know, that you're using, uh, you know, healthcare services is they're not working and maybe their family members aren't working. And it's not just the mother who has two asthmatic children. It could be, you know, the, 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 the wife, you know, or the husband who's taking care of the sick spouse, you know, who now, you know, can't work. So this whole dynamic happens. And to the extent we can keep, patients in a better quality of, of health is, is a is huge thing. It's not just COPD, it's the things like diabetes care, where, you know, you see the, 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 the you know, I'm picking on, um, you know, women here, not entirely, but, you know, the, the wife bringing her husband on a Saturday morning, you know, a, a, a six Dunkin' Donuts, you know, actual donuts and a big coffee with a lot of sugars in it, you know, and he's diabetic. And, and then you're like, man, you know, you say it very nicely. And she's like, oh, but it makes him feel better, you know? Yeah, it makes him feel better, but he's going to end up, you know, you know, they're going to start chopping stuff off. He's going to end up with kidney disease, heart disease, you know, vision issues, you know, peripheral vascular, you know, you, you, get, you get it. It's a bad thing all around. So help preventing, educating. Like if you continue to do this, this is what's going to happen to you. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to scare you. We want to help you. So let's get, you know, you a nutritional consult, maybe a psych consult. If there's some like, you know, habitual behaviors going on there and, and address it that way. Some recommended readings, and I've, I've recommended the Nash Jossie book is one of the ones that I use for my quality course. It's pretty well done. Um, and then this, this high reliability um, in healthcare, um, as well as, again, some of these links here to some of the organizations that I was uh, talking about during this presentation. 
Um, with that, I want to thank you guys um, for uh, joining uh, me for these uh, for this this, this two-hour session. Um, I want to um, thank you for for choosing A and T, and hopefully you come back to us again.